Hello and welcome to the CX Files for November 23rd, 2023. My name is Mark Hillary and I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm Peter Ryan. I'm actually today in London, Mark, where I'm finishing up a very successful trip to the UK, doing a number of different CX related meetings, as well as attending the European Contact Centre Awards that happened in London on the 21st. It's been a whirlwind and I will be anxious to get on the plane, get back to Canada and start preparing for end of year. Well, I'm sure you're looking forward to getting home um and uh enjoying some cold weather once again yeah i i embrace the winter i do like the cold weather growing up in saskatchewan where it gets down to these days minus 45 minus 50 uh you you've got to enjoy it you've got to find ways of enjoying yourself but uh, certainly i've become much more attuned to eastern canada where the weathers are a little bit damper but they're not as chilly yeah, I thought it was bad enough when we were out in Minsk together and it was about minus 25 or something like that. I mean, it was so cold that, uh, you know, even wearing jeans and, and shoes and, uh, you know, it felt like there was uh, nothing protecting your legs. Yeah, exactly. Minsk is definitely one of the colder destinations anyone can go. And I, I have vivid memories of wandering the streets with yourself as well as our hosts from the IBA group and um, having to duck in probably every few minutes to different shops and cafes just to try and get circulation back in the extremities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about the, the subject this week. Um, we're talking with Andrew McNeil, who's the Chief Customer Officer at ThinScale. Um, now, ThinScale is based out in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, Andrew's yep. over there. Um, and I think we last talked to Andrew uh, at the height of the pandemic. So it's probably three years ago. Um, you know, it was a, as everything kicked off and everybody had to move, move home suddenly, uh, we talked to ThinScale because the ThinScale, you know, essentially provides a very secure way to um, work remotely, especially for companies that are doing uh, bring your own device. So, yeah. so they allow allow people to, to use a PC or a laptop uh, and to, to completely secure the application that's being used for the, the contact center agent. So, yeah. so essentially, we sort of caught up and said, like, you know, what happened during the pandemic? Um, what's happening now? Um, what sort of hybrid arrangements are taking place right now? And 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 essentially, you know, have we seen a permanent change in in the nature of BPO? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a really interesting one. Andrew is a longtime friend of the podcast, as is Thin Scale. We've had a lot of interactions with them over the, the years. And what I can say is we're probably in a position to have no better expert talk a little bit about the whole security element when it comes to remote working and certainly when it comes to BYOD. And one of the things I love about any chat with Andrew is that he's got such a knowledge around what's happening, even beyond security, in, in terms of some of the, the operational logistics of BYOD and some of the different elements about best practices and how this can be done, which we all know has become a much bigger share of the discussion when it comes to any type of outsourced frontline delivery. Yeah, and certainly as part of the discussion, we kind of veered off um, because Andrew is retiring fairly soon. And so we kind of talked a little bit about the future of BPO without necessarily having him uh, need to represent thin scale. You know, so there's so there's a little bit of the discussion, which is more like his personal opinion on the way the industry is headed as well. So why don't we go straight to that discussion with Andrew McNeil from thin scale? Looking forward to it. Okay, Andrew, it's great to get you back. Uh, I think it's actually a couple of years um, since you were on the podcast, and that was really because of the the pandemic crisis. You know, we were talking there about the, the sudden shift to work from home and how you know ThinScale is obviously a company that helps to facilitate doing that securely. So, give me a quick quick update. What's what's happened uh, as the as the pandemic receded then? Yeah, well, I think I think we were quite right, Mark. You know, it was it was a total transformation, and it was certainly a huge transformation for our business. You know, we grew from about two million to ten million over uh, over and out during the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you know the Cholutika Bridge 
in Honduras. But it's a fabulous metaphor, I think, of a transformed landscape. And it's where there was a bridge going from one side of the river to another. And then this whole weather front came in, came back out. And by then, the, bri the, the river now moves the other side. So you've got this bridge stuck in the middle of going from nowhere to nowhere. And the river is somewhere else completely different. And I think it's always a wonderful visual metaphor of a total transformation of a landscape. And I think that that's what's happened. I think as we move kind of out beyond the pandemic, so, I mean, the big shift in the pandemic was this transition to work from home that you and I were discussing last time. And boy, did we see it. And way beyond what we could have imagined. Um, in terms of what has happened since, I think we're in a much more complex phase. Everybody likes simple, and but life is always complex. And so, first of all, you've got everybody, governments and businesses going, let's do, let's just get, do simple, everybody go back to the office. So we saw everybody trying to ram everybody back to the office. And in every case, both with governments and businesses, didn't work. Philippines government had to put their hands up under enormous pressure from BPO industry and kind of walk back a lot of their threats. Many of the big organizations, even Apple, even the great sainted Apple, had to walk back its, its position as employee revolts sort of uh, uh, took place. You know, people were recruited as remote in, in the pandemic. Now we want you in the office two days a week. You know, I've got a friend of mine who was recruited in Dublin. The office is in London. Is he going to London two days a week? I don't think so. Um, so now I think there's problems with any mode, whether you're fully remote, you're hybrid, or you're fully in the office. And I think what people are trying to do at the moment is work to resolve the issues with their particular mode and offer a combination of flexibility and efficiency that works both for company and employee. And some, as always, are doing that well, and some of them are doing it a lot less well. I think hybrid with exceptions uh, is the default for many that facilitates that collaboration and apprenticeship component. Ultimately, I think one of the key measures will be the commercial property market. That's what's going to actually show you what's really going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I mean critics of the the sort of return to office movement have office said uh, have often said that it seems that a lot of the pressure is coming from commercial landlords who are you know donating to political parties etc cetera, etc cetera. so so clearly there's there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that that is not completely obvious but and and and, and as boris johnson found out even if your mates are trying to kick you up the backside to actually get it to to, to drive that doesn't work yeah, yeah. you well, cannot think... yank people in just to appease your commercial property landlord friends the the british government is a good example because um about a year a year and a half ago you you even saw ministers demanding that that government employees come back into the office uh, and then within about six or nine months they were selling billions of pounds worth of office uh, real estate they had all these offices in central london that they suddenly decided we could actually make some money from this exactly and you've got to also look it, it, it's a different tier so you've got the short-term property let you've got the sublet uh kind of market and you've got the guys who own long term the actual buildings and everybody's at different phases of pain in terms of understanding what, what what's going on but for example our short-term property rents here in dublin and i think the same is true in the uk are very high mm -hmm. and, and when facebook paid was it 400 million to get out of a particular rent um yeah. you kind of go yeah crikey yeah you're willing yeah, to you're pay that much yeah, wow. you're thinking about that. Yeah, their new London office where they actually signed a 20 year lease yeah. uh, and they broke the lease before they'd even occupied the office. So, you know, that that, that exactly. kind of shows you that when they're spending hundreds of millions to to break a lease, they, they can see clearly that over the next 20 years, they don't need that space. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I saw um, 
Nick Bloom at Stanford sharing some data in the last couple of days, actually, that where he was suggesting that the return to office movement is not growing. It's actually hybrid that's growing. And if you sort of project out a decade or so, then you will see hybrid um, as completely normal. Uh, uh, five days a week in the office uh, will be abnormal for, for most people. So how does that affect data security? Because, you know, that that's an area where, I mean, that's where ThinScale really managed to sort of um, tap into something during the pandemic that, that so many companies were relying on a, a network firewall, you know, protecting the physical access to the office. Uh, and suddenly they had to handle all this distributed work. So, but, you know, what, what, what do you think will, will change or, or how is there a sort of focus on distributed work environments? I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that the distributed work environment is where the whole data security issue becomes much more complex uh, and people are rightly uh, concerned about it. That said, I regret to say, I think data security is a bit like environmental issues. There's a lot of lip service and not much effort. Lots of talk, no action, uh, printed slogans and no spend. I think over the course of the pandemic, I've been constantly amazed at the points where people will opt to save money over putting in some key security components on endpoints outside the offices that would protect their customers' data. Their willingness to be flahulach with their, uh, as the Irish expression has, which means uh, kind of, uh, I sure what the heck, um, uh, let's save a few pennies. Um, uh, you know, that sort of emphasis, I think, it has been surprising. Now, that's, you know, as always with these things, there's a group that think like this. There's a group who've taken it incredibly seriously. I think those, and, and they have inevitably benefited from it. And I think their customers, when they do audits on them, on if, if you're thinking about it in terms of BPOs, uh, they see that they've got the right proper security controls in place for operating uh, at work, work, um, work from home. Um, I think in terms of uh, the the focus on the new normal, we definitely saw a shift as corporate customers told BPOs they wanted their agents back in the office. Uh, and that often left BPOs with, with no alternative but to try and obey. They've got to do what their customers tell them to do. Um, although actually they often found that actually that was more complex than the customer had originally anticipated, who, as in the pre previous conversation, preferred simple over complex. So I think there is definitely at the moment a an attempt to try and clean up and tighten up uh, from the loosening that might have happened during the pandemic. And indeed, that was already happening during the latter stages you know, 2020 was flip. We've got to make it work. 2021 was crying, kind of, kind of, oh, let's tighten it up a bit. 2022 was definitely, okay, no, we've got to, if they're going to be at home, we've got to have it working properly. 23 is right. Okay. So how can we get people in the right place doing the right thing? And if we're going to be hybrid, well, what, what's the tools and so on going to look like? Um, but I, I think usually they've been doing that through terms of rather blunt instruments and not really thinking through the benefit in terms of agent operations, cost or ecology. Um, so, yeah, a lot of shift and a lot of shift at the moment. We're really very much in post pandemic mode. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that, that brings us on to bring your own device, because I know that, that that's something we've had lots of conversations about in the past, because even... Yeah. You know, even if you look at, I don't know, like a 500 person contact center, that means you need 500 devices. But then you've also got to manage the attrition. You've also got to manage reclaiming devices as people leave, making sure all those people on boarding have got devices. So you're talking about many more devices and like a whole operation trying to manage that process as well. Um, you know, you're, you're talking millions of dollars of cost. So what, what what's happening with Bring Your Own Device? Because I still see loads of BPOs sending out shipments of laptops. Absolutely. You know, you, you're just spot on there, Mark. Um, you know, we did talk about it in the past. You're absolutely right. When people do it, it does save them millions. Um, but you're more than right. The colossal wastage financially and ecologically 
is the mainstream execution mode today. So, um, and to be fair to the BPOs, I think it's the insistence of their customers that are forcing this way. But there are a number of BPOs who have seen the impact and working away at, at kind of transforming the approach. Um, and these are often the more flexible, innovative and nimble BPOs. And, you know, particularly when you've got difficulties or, or things that blow up where, let's say, an airline's operations go down, you've got to get thousands of agents quickly. Well, sending out machines is just a disaster mode because you can't even operate it logistically. You couldn't even get them there fast enough. So um, we've got BPOs who are using it, and particularly in that mode, have been hugely successful in providing really good quality service to their customer, which is both very rapid, saves them a ton of money, and make sure they're secure. So there are those who, who, who understand it. I've got another customer who's really seen the financial impact. And he is trying to drive, the guy who runs the finances in that company is driving that change through the organization. So where people get it, and there, it, it is, it's kind of like, like so many things, you get people who get this thing and people who don't. And, and the people who don't, there's no point having, you know, they just won't, even if you tell them they still won't get it like um so you know i don't think anything's changed well i don't think it's changed much since we last spoke in the, all those things that you set up this particular discussion point on are still true the opportunity for improvement for betterness for the environment for betterness for the employee instead of having four or five machines from different bpos stacked up around his office all of that stuff it's all still true. And, you know, if you've got people on short-term employment contracts, sending machine out, getting it back again, sending another one, the whole logistics thing is both a cost and ecological nightmare. But if you've got a customer who goes, I want you to send out your machines because I think it's more secure, as a BPO, you just put your hands up and go, no problem. Yeah. 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 And the other big problem, I think, with it was it, it is – with those companies, both BPOs and corporates, who tried it and didn't do it well, who messed up their own execution of it because they weren't talking to the right people who knew what they were doing. And they have their scars from that experience and they blame BYOD instead of their own incompetent execution. Yeah, yeah. So if they didn't get the logistics right, then essentially you just say BYOD doesn't work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's much easier to blame BYOD rather than to point out a number of executives in your own company who completely screwed it up. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about security and how the, the move to hybrid and work from home sort of changed the security landscape. But are there any other changes you've seen in the clients that you're working with? I mean, what, what kind of opportunities has it created to, to build a distributed workforce? Well, I think um, work from home is now an integral part of how most companies are operating. Um, and, you know, I can't think of any mainstream organization that does not have work from home as an integral part of that operation. Mm. Um, and isn't that an, an absolutely incredible, massive shift since you and I first spoke, you know, I think if you and I pre-pandemic had said, you know, a large chunk of the world's workforce would be working at home, you know, mm -hmm. people listening to us would have thought, Flip, you you guys are bonkers, like. Um, uh, so, but particularly for the high volume, uh, low paid piece where companies are keen to ensure that agents are focused and operational, um, I think one of the things that's happening there is there's for those who are work from home, there is it's creating a huge hunger for data that can then be turned into meaningful insights. Mm -hmm. Idle time, ISP performance, agent behavior patterns, switching between apps, keyboard behavior, and so on. Um, and, the, and the key, I think, is both operational effectiveness and better security and, and threat control. 
Um, and this degree of sort of endpoint reporting and intelligent endpoint reporting is something we're really helping our, our, our customers with. Mm -hmm. But I think the other significant changes that are happening are in things like training, onboarding, um, how they approach mentoring, how they manage the health of remote employees, making sure their environments are satisfactory. Um, you know, so all of those things are, are things that have shifted, um, you know, how companies are operating work from home. So I hope, is, am I answering your question with that? Yeah, yeah. And and I, I was going to ask you something that, that probably sort of draws on that um, because, you know, when we first started talking about this massive shift, I mean, especially like around March 2020, mm -hmm. um, it was just location that we were focusing yeah. on. You know, it was just... Yeah. We don't want people to come to the office so that they can stay safe and work at home. But they were essentially yeah. taking a nine to five shift in the office and doing a nine to five shift at home. Um, yeah. But we've seen it kind of evolve into flexible hours, great, greater freedom to if you want Friday off, you take Friday off and then you work a few hours next week. You know, so there's this much greater kind of flexibility that's been introduced. I mean, do you, do you think we could have even predicted any of this back at the beginning of 2020? Well, I think you know, just take that point first. I think you know, could we predict? No, I don't. I don't think anyone saw pre-pandemic the sort of seismic shift in working patterns that COVID would bring about. Um, you know, I remember running around to guys in, in, in many of the big tech companies, going, you know, let's stop. Why are you doing this commuting business? You know, that's that's all completely bonkers. My, your, I can see your guys are having two hours to commute in and two hours to commute back. That's a complete nightmare. And, I, and and this is one of the you know big top four tech companies, and he was going, no, Andrew, you're bonkers. Like, um, I I've got them in the call center, I've got it all tied down, I've got the technology under control, I've got the teams under control, I can see what's going on, I can see whether they're in good shape, blah 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 blah. So, um, could we have seen even that shift? No. Could we have seen then that all of the sort of gig environment would then have an impact in terms of flexibility of operation and that people would climb in on the back of that mm. no, i think it would have been really hard uh, yeah. to to see but to your point i think there's been a huge growth in the whole gig area um and the flexible working part of the industry so as you rightly put it you know it's beyond just pure location Mm. And that one we're particularly well connected to, uh, our company is, because it's almost exclusively BYOD, because it just does not make sense to ship PCs to gig part-time workers who might be doing shifts for a short period of time, and then off or are only doing it for, you know, where you need three employees for one full-time equivalent. Yeah. Um, the rise, I think, you know, we probably couldn't have foreseen necessarily the degree to which things like Uber and Deliveroo and all the other models for gig working would, would be a, a poker and a pointer. Um, but also that vast potential for rapid scale and opening opening up the workforce to those who can only offer time slices, mm. you know, and students and having two students in the house, so I can particularly see that very phenomenon at work um, and family carers, you know, with with childcare responsibility or even old, older people care responsibility. Yeah. But but I think in the same way with BYD, I don't think it's going to dominate the landscape. You know, I think BYD is probably 10 to 20 percent maybe of the total piece. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it, this is going to dominate the landscape. But, I, I, you know, I do think it's going to be um, a key part of the BPO space, particularly for niches like either brand fanatics, you know, people who really understand their brands, or this whole issue of really rapid scale. We've got mm -hmm. people readily accessible, and therefore you can turn on high volume at high speed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And some of it, I think, will also be embedded where you've got things like a, a requirement for workers to be US domestic based, for example, and you're, you're, you 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 want a, a different approach to that. And you're trying to cover hours that would be uncomfortable for the average US worker. So those mm. are kind of the ways in which I think um, you will see it continue to grow and expand. 
uh, I think it's going to be an important part of it. And like BYOD, I think it's going to be a, a, a section of it, but not the dominant section. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very much like your your colleague in Dublin, uh, you know, working for the company, even though the office is in London. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that that, that that definitely has become a lot a lot more common that, that companies will just almost recruit from anywhere. Yeah, and, and that company told them, uh, we now need you in the office in London. And he said, well, I'd have to resign. Mm. And so they were then having a conference in Spain. So he flew out to Spain to be with them for the conference. And then they were going to chat through how they're going to work. Mm. But I, I'm actually kind of interested to see what the outcome of that one is. That <laughs> one's kind of in the mill at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it must be repeated a lot all over the world right now. And, yeah. yeah, And he's an IT specialist. His skills mm. are not, you can't pick them up on the street like. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's one of the big differences because you were talking about the the opportunity for time slicing and and just you know fitting some some work around your own personal responsibilities and that that's very interesting because we're talking about people with skills. It, it's not just um, you know something very basic like a pizza delivery. Um, it, it's you know someone who who could easily go out and get a full time job, but but chooses to do it this way. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, whoever is the the home carer, whether it's male or female, whoever's looking after the children in the house, you know, if you've got three or four children, you need to look after them, you know, you you will often, whichever one of you is dropping the kids off to the school and then has that morning slice between 10 and 1 before mayhem is reintroduced back into the house. Mm. You know, very often those people are highly qualified, highly skilled, mm. Um and, uh, you know, could do all sorts of bits and pieces. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've only, we've only got a couple of minutes left now, and I just wanted to throw in a question about AI because that's really been the trend of this year. Um, everybody's been talking about it and, and how it affects customers. So I just wanted to ask ask you, you know, how, how has ThinScale been using AI um, just before we wrap up then? Sure. I think you're absolutely right. You know, this has been the key trend for 2023. 20, and unlike... The recent hype such as the metaverse um which meta have already initiated the funeral rites for um this one is not only here to stay but it's already having a major impact i think on the broader scale i'm already seeing you know the the world's biggest technology corporations where i have contacts inside them they're already making huge shifts internally um and thinking about repositioning their entire operations and thinking through how can they optimize every single thing that they do in light of this technology. So I think, Mark, it's going to have a similar impact to the arrival of the internet, but it's going to take time for all of that to play out because those big corporations to make massive systemic and operational change, that takes time for them to implement. I think the other thing you're seeing is every single software tool is being reconfigured with AI in mind. Uh, there must be 70 plus apps that are dedicated to various different components of, of AI. So huge amount of stuff already happening on that. Um, so that's kind of at the, at the broader level. In terms of my own company, in terms of tools that I'm using, I'm seeing already significant impact. So I use one tool I use is Gong, and they've already introduced their own technology in a really very good way, which is allowing us to do a much better job of tracking and understanding what customers are saying. What are the, so I can ask the tool, tell me what were the customer's pain points in that, in that particular call? So I don't even have to listen to every single call. I can just get really, you know, and, and what were the key points? Show me the key points out of these particular calls. So it, it's not only now giving me the transcript, which was already of a very high quality, it's taking really good. And, and now, in fact, I was engaging with them and going, guys, you need to write reports about this. So Rob, just allow me to see it for one call. Tell me about all my new business calls and what were their pain points. So I'm now then going to be pouring a ton of data at the marketing department so they can really engage with how a customer is expressing the difficulties. Um, for us, uh, I talked about earlier about the hunger for data at the endpoint in order to better understand machine, agent, network performance. 
Now, because we are residing, we're collecting all of this all the time, we have this incredible capacity and we're just moving to the cloud. So we'll be able to pull all of this stuff in huge quantity at whatever intervals that you want up in up into the cloud. But that's going to create vast data lake, lakes of information. And then what you're going to need is top quality AI tools in order to turn it into real time data that can be provided back to the agent. So the agent can self-regulate and make decisions about, oh, hang on a minute, I need to adjust this, that, or the other thing. And alerts and triggers that are going to make it much easier, action points for IT teams. So they can see before things become a problem, fix things before they actually agents go out or go down. They can see which ISPs are actually causing a problem. They can therefore ramp up agents on different ISPs so that they don't degrade the service. In other words, it's all, it's it's proactively informing and cutting down diagnostic time for IT people. So that's kind of the the direction um, we, we're going, which is building on security and giving better information alerts and behavior alerts as to where you've got agents doing stuff they maybe shouldn't be doing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fantastic. We're seeing like a massive productivity boost, uh, like across the whole the whole suite there. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right, Andrew, that is great. Thank you very much for the update. Uh, no really got completely updated from two years ago. Uh, hopefully I'll see you in Dublin soon. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week.